Yeah, it is uh, four o'clock in the afternoon and uh, a hearty welcome to everyone in this uh, session, the last, one of the last uh, parallel sessions of the uh, Global Human Resources <laughs> Forum uh, 2011 and uh, everyone here on the panel we just talked about it is uh, very impressed uh, with the attendance that, that you're all uh, still interested in what is going on here and uh, so I think uh, from the perspective of uh, the visitors here we are all guests uh, except for one speaker we're all guests here in, in this country uh, I think this is a good opportunity to start this session by saying thank you uh, to uh, you the audience uh, uh, which has been so much uh, interested uh, and committed uh, to uh, the whole conference. Uh, and also uh, thank you to the organizers uh, who provided everything in, a, uh, in an excellent uh, manner logistically, but also I think uh, in terms of uh, the contents that we've had uh, in this conference. And I'm sure we're going uh, to uh, remain on this high level of uh, performance uh, with this exquisite panel that we're uh, having here. It's also uh, uh, true to the idea of the Global Human Resources Forum, a truly global panel which is uh, spanning uh, the continents, uh, representing uh, not only different continents uh, from which uh, the individual persons uh, originate or where they work, uh, uh, but also uh, in the individual biographies. Uh, everyone here, I think, uh, has spent uh, some time in their lives uh, on several continents in several regions uh, of the world, and uh, therefore the speakers, uh, I think, already uh, speak very much uh, to the panel topic, sharing opportunities for the future donation for education. So uh, we're talking uh, about a topic that is uh, very much also and uh, uh, fittingly at the closing of the conference uh, at the crossroads at the intersection of several broad issues of this year's uh, forum. Uh, it's going to be about uh, labor markets and careers, uh, about individual life courses uh, and globalization, about education uh, not least. Uh, so we're really at the intersection of uh, broad issues of uh, the economy, on the one hand, societal changes, uh, uh, demographic changes, uh, for example, I've uh, heard very often mentioning the uh, uh, key term, the age of centenarians, and uh, this is going to be another aspect of this lifelong learning. What are you going to do next uh, when you're 60 or 70? Yeah, perhaps. Uh, and also uh, very much the individual. What is uh, the place of the individual and uh, the situation, the perspectives on the individual in the crossroads of this economic and social uh, structures. We have two main discussions and uh, two main speakers, I'm sorry, and uh, two discussions and uh, I'll introduce uh, everyone of them very briefly as they uh, speak. We're going uh, in the order that you see here uh, uh, on the table, on the podium and uh, we'll have a practitioner's uh, perspective uh, first, if I may say so, a little bit more of a practitioner's perspective from uh, Peter Tatham and uh, the second main speaker will be uh, Peter Kuczynski and uh, he's uh, at adding the a little bit more academic uh, perspective on uh, this subject matter. So I think we have a nice uh, array of uh, topics and perspectives on the very uh, same topic, I think. So the first uh, speaker, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Peter Tatham. He's the executive uh, uh, director of the Korea Industry Council of Australia and uh, has been uh, yeah, busy his whole, his whole career, I think, uh, in topics of uh, education and life course is published widely in these fields about uh, career uh, development, has uh, won several uh, awards for his uh, international activities uh, in this field. And uh, yeah, please uh, welcome with me Peter Tatham uh, from Australia. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Uh, um, knowing why, knowing how, knowing who, knowing why you came to, to this uh, conference, um, uh, knowing how and knowing who, that's uh, some of the things I want to talk about. Um, something about the Career Industry Council of Australia. Um, the Career Industry Council develops uh, quality frameworks to try and improve the quality and access to career development services in Australia. 
And we also run programs like uh, National Career Development Week for the government, and uh, we are setting standards for delivery of career services. Uh, we, we're interested in career development uh, because if you think about it, work itself is one of the ways in which we uh, contribute to the world. When I work with uh, clients who are exploring options for their future, uh, they, a number of questions arise. Questions like, why do I want to do this work? Or how do, what is this work about? What is, it, what is it purpose and meaning to me? Because work should have meaning for the individual. And part of the role of career development is to explore that notion of meaning and purpose. And then the question of how do I do this work? What are the skills I need for it? What is it? How do I acquire the skills if I don't have them? And then the other question of networking. Who do I need to contact to get this work? Who will, who will I get to know in this work? And who will I be in doing this work? These are kind of big questions for an individual. And these are some of the questions and themes that I as a career counsellor might explore with a client to develop a strategy to find opportunities. But what I want to raise in this presentation is that globally we need to think how we might enhance career guidance uh, in the context of a number of impacts on work and how work is changing itself and uh, what those new approaches might look like, what the challenges are and what are the ways forward. So what is career development, what are the challenges and what are some ways forward? Uh, just something about where I live, uh, that's um, our uh, pet sheep, Sean. Uh, that's my son there. Sean thinks he's a dog, but he's actually still a sheep. Um, there are two boys that are friends of my son. They're both Koreans. They go to the same school. They like the same music. Um, the, the, the photo on the bottom is a view from my house where I work, and that's a lake in this place called Tasmania where I live. I think uh, Korea itself is a remarkable country. It's got a remarkable history, a history that many of us don't really know that well, but it's an important history. It's, um, it's really um, one of the countries with extraordinary growth and is Australia's fourth largest trading partner. Uh, I came here last year and met with, uh, I want to acknowledge the work of the Korea Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training because it is one of the uh, major hubs for career development in Korea. When I look at the Korean flag, uh, the taeguk symbol on the flag symbolizing opposites working together in harmony and balance. And these are important elements for career development as well. In balance with self, in harmony with others. And yesterday I was impressed by the uh, speech from the Minister of Education, Science and Technology when he talked about a powerhouse of talent as a strategy for a way forward for education. And I read the first chapter last night, and what I admired was that there was a strong focus on the strategic importance of good quality career guidance in this country. And that is important because career development, we say career development in Australia, Europe say career guidance, um, I try not to confuse you, but career development is both a public and a private good. This is not something that has just emerged. Uh, the link between public policy and career development was made more than a century ago by a fellow by called Talcott Parsons. But more recently, there's been a growing international interest in how we can achieve public policy goals through effective career development. Some 55 countries have now completed reviews of their career services to more effectively meet national policy, policy, policy agendas. And that's important because we know that uh, if individuals make decisions about what they are to learn in a well-informed and well-thought-through way, they're likely to be more successful learners and achieve positive outcomes. And we know that if people construct career paths and secure employment that matches their potential and goals, they are likely to be more motiv motivated and productive and therefore contribute to enhancing national prosperity. And another important element for career development is really around uh, achieving social equity account, uh, outcomes, providing services to people who otherwise might not get uh, realise their potential. I remember a director of Shell Petroleum saying to me once, what price the next general manager? The potential of all of us is very important. But what do I mean by career development? 
Put simply, it's basically the process of managing life, learning and work over the lifespan. It's not one decision for one moment. It's something that we need to do and adapt over the lifespan. Internationally, there's an accepted definition of career guidance. This is the OECD definition that is really accepted around the world to assist people of any age and at any point throughout their lives to make educational training and occupational choices. Uh, career development services help people to reflect on their ambitions, hopes and dreams, to think about what is interesting to them, to look at their skills and review them, to understand what they value about work, to think about the qualifications they need and to understand the labour market and education systems and to relate that to what they know about themselves. And we need to think about what are the services likely, what, what is important about these services for the future. The other element that I'm interested in is really about opportunity awareness, being able to, uh, uh, to understand where the next opportunity might be and how to position yourself for it. Because new jobs are being invented all the time, jobs that we didn't even think about a few years ago. It's only, it's only less than 13 years since Google was invented, less than seven years since, my, since Facebook and all of the work that goes with that. Refining skills to enhance opportunity is a key task for career development services over the next decade. It's also important for organisations to think about how they deliver career development services because it's important to assist individuals to plan and manage their careers and the careers of the employ their employees. Uh, this is um, because, in, in fact, it's within organisations that we develop a great deal about uh, great aspects of our career. Research says the career development service, services improve uh, self-awareness and confidence to explore career options, and that's important, to understand the, and get, gain knowledge of opportunities, to uh, build career strategies and to improve decision-making on what to learn and, and, uh, and, and who might employ them, and to, do, to understand the job search process and to practice and, and develop interview skills. So a range of different things. If we get it right, we believe that it can lead to a better fit in the workplace, improved productivity, and a more satisfying work life. Career development is also good for business. Uh, I do a bit of work for an organisation who did a survey with uh, senior executives. And the response was that about a third wanted to leave within a year. If you lose major talent, if you lose leadership from a business, it becomes a very expensive process. Uh, what we're trying to do at the moment is whether we can develop audit tools to help business better understand the kind of services they need to provide for their employees. Career development is also important for workforce development. We need to assist people throughout their lives, particularly at three points, preparing young people to access learning and enter the workplace to help workers in the workplace adapt for change and to make different choices, to help mothers who are left the workforce and coming back in to re-enter uh, in a satisfying way and, with, and without sort of denouncing the skills they've, 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 uh, they've been given, and help others as we uh, work for much longer periods of time to re-enter the workforce. And increasingly in places like Australia to uh, attract talent and retain talent. In essence, career development is very messy. All of us are balancing plates. We're balancing plates from family, from responsibilities for family, for leisure, for study, for all sorts of things. And it makes it quite kind of difficult. If you look at the red line, we see a traditional career path, maybe going into uh, Iwa University or, 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 or uh, Seoul National University, uh, do an internship and then get a job with Samsung. That's a traditional pathway. But for more of us, it's actually more of a jagged road. We get here, we drop down here, we go up, we go down, we go around, and we have to make choices throughout our life. We have to know what we have to offer. We have to understand who needs what we have. We have to know how we can add value to the jobs that are being advertised, and we have to know how to get there. So it's important. Particularly at a time of great uncertainty, 
because the choices and decisions individuals make in relation to learning and work determine the nature and quality of their lives, the kind of people they become, the sense of purpose they have, and the, kind of, the amount of income at their disposal. And it impacts on the social and economic contribution they can make. And that is why lots of countries are doing all kinds of different things to bolster their career development. New skills for new jobs in Europe, and new skills being developed and underpinned by effective career guidance. Evidence collection and improved assessments in Finland and Hungary. Improved technology approaches in Slovenia, Canada, New Zealand and the UK. All ages throughout the lifespan approaches in New Zealand and Wales and the UK. Parents as career coaches in Canada. Careers in the curriculum in Korea. Career policy networks in Europe. External in, and internal support in Denmark, both within the school and external to it. Uh, helplines, telephone helplines where people can ring up and get careers advice in Australia, New Zealand, UK and South Africa. Improving attainment and retention in UK and Australia. Cultural awareness for different cultures in different places in New Zealand. And to increase enrolments in science in Rwanda and Kazakhstan. So both developing and developed countries are using career development in different ways. And quality frameworks in Australia. In Australia, there is a focus on improving retention. How can we improve, get people to stay in the school system? How can we uh, get people to achieve a good result? To develop a national career development strategy, the government is currently uh, spending about $700 million on career development services. Uh, but they're also starting to look at how we might improve these services across the lifespan. And services are being put in place for mature age workers. The retirement age has recently been increased from 65 to 67. And using, particularly in universities and in schools, to get higher levels of experience in the workplace, uh, called workplace or work integrated learning. So these are important elements of, uh, of policy uh, involvement. And these are important because there are a number of challenges ahead. Six. Firstly, global migration. We're going through the, uh, between now and 2030, we will be going through the greatest migration in human history. And as you look at that slide, you can see, um, you can see how from the, the first part of AD through to 1600, through to 1950, each of those dots is a million people. And just how the population and where that is going and how that will change the way in which work will do, have, occur in your lifetime and the different jobs that will become available. But that's not the only uh, uh, challenge. The challenge is also about climate change and green jobs. In Australia, we're starting to think about the kind of opportunities that will emerge out of climate change and green jobs. Renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable water systems, biomaterials, green buildings, waste and recycling. And what sort of advice do we give people about those jobs, some of which are not yet invented? The other issue is really around this notion of a regional labour market. We have, uh, what if the whole of the Asia-Pacific region became a labour market? We have the same problems as Korea. Will we have enough skilled people to do the work that needs to be done? Australia gets some of its labour already from the Pacific Islands, to work in, under special visa arrangements to work on farms. There are already around 1.2 million overseas-born people living in Australia from Asia. There are currently more than 150,000 Australians working in Asia, an increase of over 50% in the past decade. What they're saying is that there are better employment opportunities in the region to come backwards and forwards, a chance for professional development, career advancement, and an interesting lifestyle. And of course, there's the other challenges, the global financial crisis and what that will mean for us. One thing that we're thinking about is that it may lead to new ways of working, both good and bad. We already know in Australia, for example, that young people are bearing the brunt, the brunt of the global financial crisis. We know that uh, there are reduced hours for part-time and casual workers. There's restructuring and job losses occurring. There's a manufacturing slowdown and graduates are starting to find it a little bit more difficult to find work. 
We, we also need to think about how we help individuals reorganize in these kind of times. How they need, because if a business goes bad, government will often spend money in helping an organization restructure. We need to think similarly about how people restructure their thinking about their career in a time of change. At the same time, we need to look after ourselves. Our health and well-being becomes important. Work-life balance is a critical issue. How long is a fair amount of time to work in a day in order to leave time for other, uh, other things? I work with sports coaches, and many have no work-life balance at all. They describe their work as like a second wife or a mistress. It takes up all of their time. So reworking that and trying to understand how to balance that may become an issue as we are being asked to work longer in this workplace. In Australia, there's also this issue of managing talent. How do we keep people on board? It's becoming an increasing issue in a kind of two-speed economy in which uh, we have a, a, a booming mining industry at the moment in which we can't get enough truck drivers, engineers, uh, designers, architects to develop the infrastructure that is needed. So what is the answer to all of this? What are the ways forward for career development? Firstly, although we have good career information, it's not presented in a way that can be accessed 24-7 in an integrated way and in a, in a way that uh, is interactive through uh, various uh, technologies and media to enhance that experience. When you look around, you see everybody using a smartphone to look up something here, there and everywhere. So we need to be able to do the same thing and access careers advice in a speedy way. Career advice needs to be available lifelong, life-wide. People need careers advice when they're 15, 14, 70, 60, 50, 40, throughout their lives. Um, particularly as the word retired is becoming redundant in many environments. We also need to uh, strengthen organisational career development initiatives to balance individual career management with organisational priorities. Are we getting the angle right? Is the, is the balance right? How do we audit uh, career development systems to make sure they're delivering what companies need but also benefiting individuals? How do we train line managers to deliver career development services at, 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 at uh, low levels and, and across the, the business? And how do we sort of look at lifelong, life-wide career development services in organisations? We also need to strengthen career management skills so that people can access and use career services more effectively. I've talked to young people who have said they've not accessed the career services in their schools or their universities at all. How can we identify opportunities and to develop our employability skills which will sustain us in work over our lifetime? How can we understand how the labour market works and place ourselves into it? How do we know how and why jobs are changing and develop skills to progress in the workplace? And how can we enhance our own career decisions through planning? These are important and it needs to start early. Career management skills should be part of the curriculum at a very early age. There's also this notion of career entrepreneurship. How am I taking charge of this thing called my career? If I was a business of one and I was the leader of my own enterprise, how would that change my thinking about this career, my own personal career, my own business of one? How would I invest in the opportunities that I see around me, invest in myself to take them up? How could I challenge the assumptions that I'm not good enough to do something? How could I allow myself to fail and not criticise myself? Failure is part of the experience of exploring career and work. How do I know why I want to do work and how I get it? Are important questions in terms of being a good career entrepreneur. This is work that is supported by uh, uh, researchers in Russia and in America and a number of other places, that this, uh, this career entrepreneurship is one of the focuses of the next stage of career development. At the same time, balancing social good and self-interest. We also need a stronger evidence base. We need, uh, it would be valuable to see more clearly about how we can improve career development services through greater liaison across the Asia-Pacific region. 
and we are working with Crivet on that uh, very task. To, to research opportunities for a regional approach for career information and guidance. To improve standards for how services are being delivered, not just a teacher without any, any uh, uh, background or qualifications in career development, but a true understanding of these services. And how do we develop better assessment tools so young people can make better decisions about their next steps? The other issue, of course, is the, the role, a stronger, to strengthen uh, uh, a stronger role for the Asia-Pacific region to influence how career development services are delivered. For too long, there has been a stronger European and American uh, focus on how career development services. But as the engine room of global growth, it's probably time for uh, the Asia-Pacific region to take a much stronger focus in terms of contributing to global thinking on how career development services should be delivered. If we can do this, it will be an asset for, to the region and globally. Career development learning is a smart education for reinventing your future. Thank you very much, Peter Tatham. And uh, our next speaker is also uh, Peter, Peter Kuczynski, and uh, he has developed his career perhaps using a career development service or rather not in these old days uh, when uh, making uh, a shift from his native Germany to the United States where he uh, did his studies uh, in psychology and uh, eventually after many years of uh, practical work also in education and after advancing to a PhD in uh, human resources uh, 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 went on to become a professor of uh, human resource development at uh, the University of uh, Illinois in the United States. And uh, yeah, the floor is uh, yours uh, for your topic, Boundaries of the Boundaryless Career, Enabling Success in an Era of Globalization. Please. Annyeong haseyo. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you. And thank you for the opportunity to visit Korea in this wonderful season of the year. I've had the chance to visit Korea many times over the past 10 years, but never in the fall. So this is a particular treat for me. I also bring greetings from the University of Illinois. Those of you who are alums of our university and several in the audience will recognize the uh, central campus of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We are proud of the large number of Korean students who study at, at Illinois. Uh, of the 8,000 international students, uh, over 1,500 are Koreans. And Korean students make up more than one-fifth of our international student body in human resource development. So your contributions are vital to the success and the diversity of our program. Um, my talk will follow up on Peter's very interesting and broad introduction to the area of, of career development. Um, if you are like me, you will come away from this conference with many, many ideas about the macro picture, about the policy imperative, about the need to reform systems, about the need to develop structures at the macro level to enable education, training, and success at work. I'd like to complement this perspective by looking at the micro perspective from an organizational behavior and industrial psychology perspective, which is my particular background. No matter how important the macro policy making level is, policies and organizational strategies are only as good as the implementation, the realization of the policies of the strategies. And policy implementation and strategy realization happen through people. They happen through individuals. So a big part of the conversation about global competitiveness and education has to do with the individual. And as individuals, we live and participate in society through work. This is an old idea that, that, that Peter addressed. It goes back to James Dewey, who said that a primary means for individuals to participate in society is through work. 
work can be can take a number of different forms. Most of our work is employment, work for money, work to cover the basics that we need to live. But there are many other forms of work. There's voluntary work, there's work in the family, there's work in the community. So I'd like, us, I'd like to challenge us to think of work and preparation for work, not only in terms of employment, but in the broader sense of a vital contribution that we make to society. One of the most popular and I think most promising ideas in career development over the past 20 years or so is the notion of the boundaryless career. And I'd like to focus my topic on that. The boundaryless career, also known as the protean career, is a career that's primarily self-directed. A career that is driven by the values, the desires, the needs of the individual and not primarily that of the employer. So rather than looking at individuals as passive role takers, we take a job as an accountant, as an economist, as something in an organization and fulfill those requirements, the boundaryless career, the self-directed career turns this around and argues let's look at the possibility, the opportunity, the promise of a career that's driven by the needs, the values, the beliefs of the individual, and then see what organizational structures will follow. The boundaryless career has been, at least in the North American literature, tremendously overvalued. Uh, there is the impression, if one reads the psychology literature, that this is the only form in which a satisfying and successful career is possible. This is not true. And so in my talk, I want to address the boundaries of the boundaryless career and talk about the conditions that need to be fulfilled in order for this self-direction to take place. At the same time, I believe that the promise of the boundaryless or self-directed career has not been explored enough in terms of um, solving inefficiencies in the labor market and contributing to society through work. So I want to make two points. The first one I want to point out to some of the mistakes that have been made in reporting the boundaryless or uh, protean career and at the same time look at the promises that the, uh, this new understanding of career and work entails for all of us. Careers take place at, the, at many levels of analysis. We need to look at careers from an individual point of view but careers also respond to organizational requirements and these requirements are embedded into the national and global context in which work takes place. Through, throughout the career I will look at different levels, the individual, the organizational and the national or, or global. And I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by protean or boundaryless career, about what we know from research uh, what the boundaries or contingencies are for this kind of type of career behavior and then what the implications are for career development, for organizational career systems and for national and global human resource development. Okay. I assume that many of you will have, be, will have heard or read about this notion of the boundaryless or a protean career. It's a response to the changing nature of work, the churning of the economy over the past 30 or 40 years, roughly since the 1980s, has led to many changes in the nature of work, increased competition, a global network of suppliers and customers, a radical change in technology, and in work processes and work procedures. And as a result of this new work, this new condition in which work takes place, organizations have adapted and have adapted very rapidly through changing strategies, through implementing new structures. And these structures have to do with mergers and acquisitions, with global supply chains, with downsizing, with outsourcing, with flattening of the organizational hierarchy. And each of these and all of these developments together have impacted the way work is being done. When I started to work in the 1980s, 
I had a very nice corner office. I had a secretary who would do my correspondence. If I wanted to dictate a letter, I would call her in. She would take notes. She would type it up, give it to me for correction, and then mail it out. This process took about an hour, an hour and a half, and we did this day after day. Now, I work on my computer. I work on multiple projects at the same time. I no longer have a secretary, and none of my colleagues do. Um, the nature of work has changed dramatically, and this is in part due to these, these changes that, that we mentioned. Employment patterns have changed. Organizations that in the past have been able to employ individuals for the long term, for a life, 20, 30, 40 years, now think of work and jobs in terms of projects. They hire and employ the right numbers of people for a short duration. When the project is done, people get reassigned. Sometimes they leave the organization. Sometimes they get assigned to, to new jobs. Our understanding, what researchers call the psychological contract, has changed. Employers and individuals no longer expect organizations to provide the kind of security that was there before. Um, and this has large um, implications for our behavior. We think employees think of themselves and can no longer rely on the fact that an organization will provide for them. Organizations will no longer provide for the long-term development, for career progression. It is now on the shoulders of the individual, in many cases, not, certainly not in all. And finally, they're changing individual preferences that we can talk about. So as a result, Tim Hall started to talk about this thing of the protean career in the 1970s, but the idea did not take hold until the mid-1990s. The protean career is based on a figure in Greek mythology. Proteus was a sea god, and Proteus had the wonderful ability to take on any form or shape that he wanted. He could change himself in any number of ways that he wanted to, and he did so. So the protean career then is a career that is driven by the person, not the organization. A protean career is a career that is being reinvented by the person from time to time. We may have five, six, seven, eight different careers over the period of a life. It's an agreement not primarily with the organization, but with oneself and one's work. Arthur and Rousseau coined a uh, related construct called the boundaryless career, and you see the definition here. The new career pattern looks like this. This is Hall from 1996. Rather than a linear career that starts from schooling to entrance into the organization to advancement to retirement in linear fashion, like one of Peter's slides showed, the new career pattern looks a little bit more jumbled. So one um, progresses not linearly over a lifetime, but takes many different jobs. You see on this slide the four stages of, career, um, of careers, exploration, trial, establishment, and mastery. And this cycle repeats itself over the, uh, the lifetime of an individual several times. Yeah? There may be breaks in between where the individual returns to work, perhaps to get more education, perhaps to get training, perhaps to spend time with, a career, with, a, with family. So over the period of a lifetime, individuals, according to this new pattern, develop a portfolio or a kaleidoscope of different career experiences. A related idea comes from Peter Capelli, who talks about the free agent um, as the new worker. And free agent in, in, in American language is a sports metaphor. Basketball players become free agents when they no longer uh, work, uh, play for one team, but in fact they sell their competence, their performance on the market to the highest bidder. Similarly, Capelli talks about the new worker as a free agent, and free agency requires certain meta-competency. No longer obedience or um, uh, duty to an organization, but a high level of identity, adaptability, flexibility, relational networks, tolerance for ambiguity, and openness to new experience. 
We are not used to think of career competencies in these terms. The traditional career had much more to do with fulfilling one's duty, uh, being loyal to the organization, hoping that the organization would provide in return for commitment and, and hard work. So then, what do we know about this protean or self-directed career from the research literature? And I want to address three levels, individual, national, and organizational. On the national level, they, on the, sorry, on the individual level, there has been a fair amount of construct development. Um, Briscoe summarizes this. We have defined constructs. We have survey instruments that measure this um, mindset, this attitude towards new career behavior. And the two key constructs here have to do with values driven. So people who score high on protein mindset have strong beliefs about what they want to do, what they want to accomplish, how they want to contribute to society. They also have a strong sense of independence, of being in charge of their career rather than relying on an organization or an employer to find work. The empirical research shows that there is a strong correlation, that, that there are strong age, gender, and education effects. Protein mindsets tend to be stronger in young age than in old age. Um, men seem to have higher propensity for mindsets than this mindset than women, unless work is defined as work in the community and the family. But at least in employment relations, men tend to score higher. And uh, individuals with higher education levels tend to have more of this protean or boundaryless career mindset. There's also a positive correlation with mastery, with a sense of accomplishment, and a sense with career satisfaction. So individuals who pursue the self-directed career feel more satisfied with their career and feel more in charge of what it is that they do. The protean career, interestingly, is not related to mobility. So individuals may or may not want to change locations the place where they work, whether or not they are high on this uh, career uh, protein mindset. Gerber and others from the, um, um, one of the leading universities in Switzerland um, reviewed a lot of research from different countries and cultures, including the US, UK, Austria, uh, Switzerland, and, and Germany, and indicated a shift on career orientation from working for leisure, working for consumption, to an emphasis on employability. But interestingly enough, in the research that they provide, only 25%, one in four survey participants in these different countries have a preference for this alternative career. 75% still prefer the traditional career that is driven by the organization. My own work and that of our colleagues, including some of the uh, Korean researchers here in the audience, on work centrality uh, supports this kind of um, orientation towards career. We surveyed the attitudes towards work, the meaning of work, understanding of work in eight countries, in Brazil, Hungary, Germany, Korea, Kyrgyzstan, Poland, Russia, and the US. And three findings are important. First of all, in all eight countries, absolute work centrality was very high. These are mid-career professionals working for large organizations, and all of them ranked work as a high importance in their lives. Interestingly enough, however, in the importance of family compared to work was higher. So individuals said, work is important, but my family is more important than work. Second, when we looked at the desired outcomes from work, there was a strong preference in at least four of the eight countries for extrinsic rewards, financial rewards, advancement in the organization, being associated with a strong company. And this pattern suggests that the traditional mindset, the traditional attitude towards, the, uh, towards a career is very much um, uh, was very much prevalent in these eight countries. 
So rather than finding a predominance of the new career orientation, the self-directed orientation, a lot of research still talks to the fact that most of us, most people surveyed, prefer the old job, the old career. And that's a problem because organizations can no longer offer the traditional career. So there is a mismatch, a disconnect between what individuals want from work and what organizations are offering. Looking at a national and global level, we find that the, a self-directed career has the potential to remedy some of the inefficiencies of the labor market. Unemployment rates are rising globally, and you see some of the statistics here. We have 7% of the global workforce of 3 billion uh, who are unemployed. Um, in addition to that, 12% for a total of 19%, almost one in five, are underemployed. And underemployed is defined as working part-time involuntarily, not out of choice, but out of necessity. The International Labour Organization talks about almost one, of one half of the global workforce as being in vulnerable employment. In vulnerable employment are people working in domestic settings, as um, home aides, as, uh, as, as servants, um, in migrant labour situations, in uh, difficult, dangerous working conditions such as breaking ships in, uh, in, in India and, and Bangladesh. Almost one half. Long-term unemployment is rising, um, and youth unemployment, as we heard several times, is also rising. Um, in addition, we, and this has been repeated during this conference, we have a mismatch between work, the work that's available, and the qualifications of a worker, and only those with high levels of education globally enjoy abundant opportunities for work. What this tells us at the... Um, global level, is that the opportunity for self-directed career behavior to remedy some of the inefficiencies in the labor market is certainly present. Looking quickly at the organizational level, we said that organizations are no longer to provide the type of jobs or the amount of work that people seek, but organizations also are working within structures where work is not allocated efficiently. Uh, there is plenty of research that um, many employees who are full-time employed, in fact, are no longer putting in their best effort. Um, the Gallup poll talks about a retrenchment rate of one in three. These are employees who are employed but are not putting forth their best, best effort. Um, organizations are complaining about the lack of leaders in people ready to um, advance to senior positions, and we have a high level of failure rate among newly appointed leaders. And what this tells me is that self-directed career behavior is a desire that organizations cannot fulfill. Organizations are currently not structured to take advantage of the attitudes and abilities and desires that people have. Now, let's briefly talk about some of the boundaries and requirements for self-directed career behavior. Edgar Chine is uh, known to have done research on career anchors. These are core beliefs about work. And we find that self-directed career behavior requires um, a low need for security and a low need for stability, high autonomy and independence, high technical and functional competencies, and the others. And the reason why the self-directed career is relatively rare is because few employees, few of us, are high on all these uh, career anchors and fulfill the requirements for self-directed career. We have plenty of research from developmental psychology that the degree of psychological maturity that's needed to work in this fluid, complex work environment in a self-directed fashion is actually rare fewer than one half of individuals, according to Kagan and, and others, possess this. Societal boundaries, in addition to individual boundaries. Um, the entrepreneurship survey by the World Bank, doing business in 2011, talks about important structural barriers to self-directed uh, career behaviors. Uh, nations that uh, foster entrepreneurship need to have easy legal processes to start a business. 
there needs to be an easy availability of startup capital um, and uh, employment regulations that are easy and a tolerance for failure. And in many countries around the world, failure in business, which comes naturally with self-directed career behavior sometimes, uh, is severely punished. In my native Germany, for example, entrepreneurs who fail will have a hard time starting another company because the public views their failure as a personal shortcoming. In the United States, on the other hand, business failures are viewed as a learning opportunity. If somebody's put in their best effort and the organization or the business did not succeed, well, he, he or she learned valuable lessons that come in handy the next time. I need to shift forward to my implications and, and recommendations for the sake of time. As I said before, the gist of my talk is that the amount and the prevalence of self-directed career behavior has largely been exaggerated. Uh, self-directed career behavior requires a high level of personal, societal, and organizational requirements that are not always given. At the same time, self-directed career behavior has the opportunity to add to career success, to add to organizational success through innovation, and to alleviate some of the labor market shortcomings and inefficiencies through high levels of unemployment. Self-directed career behavior is something that can be learned and certainly something that can be taught. It is also something that can be supported. So, career development and career counseling has a key role to play in alerting individuals that a self-directed career as an entrepreneur, as a person who exhibits their own values in, in work is possible. Um, career development, career counseling needs to provide a realistic preview of the benefits and the shortcomings of traditional and non-traditional, i.e. protean careers. We need to have full disclosure about the risks and the rewards of alternative forms of careers. We need to foster strength of character and enable individuals to be, have, be resilient in the case of failure or setbacks in their careers. Organizations stand much to gain by loosening their bureaucratic and hierarchical structures and enable individuals to be intrapreneurial. We want to enable organizations who can tap into the desires, the passions that individuals have and not just constrict their roles too tightly. A nice example of that is the uh, 3M 15% rule. It's well known at 3M, 15% of, uh, sorry, engineers, research engineers, are able to spend 15%, six hours every week on projects that are not related to current production priorities. They can experiment, pursue their own thoughts about what might work. There are performance requirements, but the organization allows some freedom for self-directed behavior. Abbott Laboratories. Um, brings together women at Abbott in communities of practice to help women at Abbott explore a way to advance in their organization and contribute new ideas and innovative ideas. These are form of self-directed career behavior that organizations stand, can exploit and can take advantage of. And finally, at the national and global level, uh, self-directed career behavior, protean careers require high levels of competence. There is no question about that. And so the call for increase is in formal education, um, in technical, academic, and social competencies are well placed. Many universities and many countries, Kenya would be an example, uh, place high value on entrepreneurship education in high school, in universities, in technical and vocational settings. Entrepreneurship education is the whole craft of starting a business, of launching a self-directed career. 
Um, so, in short, organizations and countries need to create opportunity structures for self-directed careers. So, in conclusion, we said that the uh, changing nature of work is such that organizations can no longer fulfill the need and the quantity for traditional careers. Work and the economy is changing too much. At the same time, individuals, at least a certain percent, desire higher flexibility, desire more self-direction in, in their career. Self-directed career is then a response to changing economic conditions that presents opportunities for some, but the number of people prepared to launch self-directed careers is too small. We need to embellish, we need to enhance the preparedness of people to work not just in traditional career settings, but also in innovative and self-directed careers. And I think this will have benefits for individuals, for organizations, and societies. Okay. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Come sam nida. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we proceed to our two discussions. And uh, they will be short, or so say promised uh, me. And I will take them by their words, uh, so that we have uh, some time, uh, of course, left for your questions for the question answer uh, session with which we will close uh, this uh, panel eventually. So the first discussant is uh, Pedro Serdan. He's a native of Spain and has, uh, uh, despite his relatively young age, and I'm glad that we have two relatively young people here also as discussants, especially as discussants uh, on the podium, as they can uh, see what has been kind of uh, proposed uh, by the elderly, if I may say so, yeah, in there and reflect uh, in their own careers. Uh, uh, so uh, Pedro Serdan, despite his young age, has uh, crossed at least three continents from his native Spain uh, to North America and uh, to uh, Asia, where he's currently working uh, for the World Bank and uh, uh, based in Jakarta for uh, development questions in the East Asia Pacific region. And with that, uh, it is uh, your turn. Please, Pedro. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you, the Peters. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Pedro uh, is actually Peter also, so I think that was a requirement to, uh, to be in the, in the panel. Uh, so I'll, I'll be brief with my comments, uh, most of all because I want to avoid the little notes that uh, Paul has been passing uh, to make sure that we speed up the conversation until we have uh, time for your questions, um, and because I think that's why, why you're all here. But uh, So let me, so first, just... Uh, I want to make it clear, this is the first time I've actually thought about career development, um, except my own, of course. I think we all think about career development uh, when we are forced to think about it. Um, and I, I, I'm glad that I was asked to discuss uh, in this session because it's actually made me realize how important a piece of the puzzle is um, for reinventing the future of education. So as uh, to find a systematic way of dealing with it. So. Um, Right now in Indonesia, uh, as an economist for the World Bank, we're working very closely with the government of Indonesia to try, actually, to reinvent the future. They're calling it uh, meeting the demand for skills in the 21st century. But really, it is about thinking what, what Indonesia is going to look like in the future. And I think it's an exercise that Korea went through uh, 50 years ago um, rather successfully. And so, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. So, um, so I just want to give you the, the perspective um, from the policymakers' point of view, and, and what my Indonesian friends in the government would ask me if uh, if I went and presented the results that we just heard. Uh, but we well, what can we do about it? Um, so I, I basically have just that one question: is is what can the government of Indonesia or any other country, for that matter, do about career development? And um, I think we all sort of assume that career development um, starts in secondary school, vocational school, higher education. That's sort of when one thinks that it's relevant to start thinking about the career. But listening to, the, uh, to Peter um, talk about the career development as a public good, uh, it made me think about this, this really cool experiment that a professor of mine trees. It's lack of information. It's lack of relevance of what they're learning. 
And it's not, in part, it's, it's, it's uh, the fault of the curriculum, but a lot of it is just uh, lack of information about what you can do with education. So I think a, a first question that, that I would pose to the panel is, where, how early can we start in career development? So what can we do at the basic education level? Uh, entrepreneurial skills, um, what, what, what is it that is important to introduce in the early stages? And the second point related to what can the government do is, uh, I think another big thing that career development does is, uh, is linked to a network. In, we've done research in Indonesia that shows that 90% of formal jobs are actually gotten through personal connections. So um, the access to these networks at this point is very um, limited and very personal. So I think by finding a systematic way of dealing with career development at all stages in education, we can actually achieve more, and it's a relatively cheap and easy solution. So I think I find, I find this very challenging and a very interesting point. So the, the, the second question would be how to expand the networks, how to use public schools, um, what sort of institutional framework we can have to link schools to, uh, to the um, productive sector through career development. And the third one, uh, sort of component of career development that I've picked on and, and that I think is, is also very relevant is, is this issue of self-awareness and self-confidence. Just by knowing that there are opportunities out there for people like you, um, that actually raises your chances of doing well in school and ultimately in the labor market. So, so what kind of format can these life skills um, have in early career development guidance, especially as I, as I mentioned in, in early stages of education? And the, the last point, um, I think, which is, is, is one of the challenges we're finding in Indonesia is uh, how to actually get feedback into the system. So one thing is to advise students on how they should approach career development, what the opportunities uh, might be out there for them. Another one is to make schools uh, change their behavior and their curriculum and their practices in response to that, uh, the availability of careers after the, the graduates um, go into the labor market. So how, how can career development work um, on that front. So, it, should it, so in my mind, what we're trying to do is bring people from the private sector to be the advisors in the public schools and sort of have linkages uh, of that sort. But it, it's not easy to do um, because the incentives are not there. So, so I'll be very interested in getting your, your, your thoughts on that. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. And uh, last not least, let me introduce uh, Yunhee uh, Park. And it's uh, very appropriate that uh, we finish with a Korean uh, scholar here in this panel and for the conference. And also, uh, perhaps appropriate that uh, we have uh, someone working with the Korea In Research Institute for Vocational Education and Training, the Krivet Institute, about which we've heard so much during that whole conference. And uh, Yunhee Park is uh, a research fellow with that uh, institution. She is. Uh, studied at Iwa Women's University and at Seoul National University, two of the institutions that have been mentioned as a paradigm of the uh, old and classical Korea, uh, actually, uh, in a previous talk. But she has done something unusual and has taken a double a PhD or two PhDs, one in vocational education at Seoul National University and one at human resource development in the United States at Ohio State University. And we're very much looking forward to your uh, brief comments. Thank you. Thank you for a uh, kind introduction and thank you for be giving me a chance to have a discussion uh, in this forum. Uh, I'm Yunyi Park uh, in Krivet and nice meet you all, uh, nice meet all of you. Uh, uh, it's very honored to have a discussion for uh, two speakers, uh, actually two Peters. Director Peter Tatum and 
a very well-known uh, scholar uh, in HRD field, Dr. Peter Kuching. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in general, I agree with two ideas of two speakers. So, I would like to add some comments on the issue of uh, career development in globalized society. As a discussant, I will talk about a little bit about uh, different views on careers first, and then I will show you uh, different career models. And finally, I will suggest some implications for individuals, organizations, and uh, Korean students. This is um, uh, traditional versus emerging views of careers. Uh, as you know, economic environment is uh, was stable in the past, but nowadays economic condition is very uh, dynamic and uh, very turbulent. In terms of a career choice, people had one career uh, in, the in the past. They tended to have one career and decided their career at an early career age. However, uh, these days, people are likely to shift their careers so that they have several careers whenever they want to have. And in terms of ownership of career responsibility, it was for organization, but these days, career responsibility lies with individual. And uh, in the past, Career uh, people worked for uh, usually only one employer. However, as uh, job security is not guaranteed anymore, uh, people are likely to work for several companies, several organizations. And uh, in terms of career relationship, it was a long-term based with job security, whereas these days, the career relationship is changed to short-term based and sometimes contract based. In addition, employee expected job security in the past, but uh, as I mentioned before, lifetime employment is not guaranteed anymore people tend to invest uh, their energy in employee employability. And career development was focused on upward mobility in the certain organization. But this tendency is changed into including uh, even lateral moves as well. A meaning of success is changed from progress on the hierarchy ladder to internal satisfaction. Career path is changed as well. It is changed from linear, static, rigid to multi-directional, dynamic, and fluid. Based on the reviews of uh, different aspects of careers, we can see a uh, change of the career models from linear career model to multi-directional career model. In linear career model, there was only one mountain, so every people, all the people want to climb up the summit of only one mountain. And um, people are focused on national op opportunities for career uh, in their own country. However, this uh, model is changed to multi-directions, such as uh, a variety of mountains, which means that there are lots of mountains so that people, have, people can choose whatever mountain they want to climb up. And some people even create their own path with uh, career entrepreneurship. Also, people are interested in global opportunities for careers, 
which means that they realize that their career paths can be done in overseas countries. And finally, I will suggest some implications for individuals. As economic condition is stable, is not stable anymore, people need to count on themselves. Also, to secure employment is very important. However, I want to say that to gain employability is more critical in these days. And people need to have intelligent career approach, such as know why, know how, know whom, know what, know where, and know when. And individuals need to be resilient to be able to respond to external changes. This is implications for organizations. Employers need to realize that employee loyalty for only one organization is not valid anymore. So they need to provide alternative work and career path arrangements, including job rotations, multiple skills development. Also, they need to identify how to provide staff with motivating career path. Finally, they need to develop career planning system to help, help employees to identify and take positions consistent with their own goals and their career plans. Additionally, I want to give some comments for Korean students. Recently, Korean government encourages Korean school graduate to have employment in overseas countries. So they provide many useful programs to students, such as global internship programs and work-based learning abroad programs for vocational high school students, as well as two-year and four-year college students. In this sense, we need to think about this, what they, need to, what they need to learn from these experiences and what competencies they need to acquire to prepare overseas uh, career. First, I want to suggest that they need to have global mindset. And second, secondly, they need to recognize overseas career opportunities as their career path. In addition, they, and they need to uh, have, they need to learn foreign language skills mixed with subject skills and knowledge. Also, they need to understand different workplace contexts such as policies and industrial cultures. Most importantly, I think they need to acquire a cross-cultural awareness and multicultural awareness because they are likely to work with many people who come from overseas countries. This is the end of my uh, discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for listening and thank you everyone on the panel for being so uh, aware of the time. So we have uh, 15 minutes at least uh, left for discussion for your uh, questions and uh, I'd like to ask uh, everyone to come forward with uh, questions but also to be brief uh, in their questions and uh, if possible to address a specific speaker uh, on the audience also like the uh, panel uh, to be brief in their answers, and I realize that uh, uh, there might be some discussion within the panel, on the panel ongoing, uh, certainly as uh, Pedro has addressed uh, the, uh, the speakers, but uh, 
Uh, I would like to ask you to refrain from immediate answers. We first take questions, and then, then you can answer Pedro's uh, or uh, uh, Ms. Sparks' uh, questions uh, in uh, other answers. There's a microphone uh, available, yeah. And I'd like to make sure uh, English translation of questions uh, asked in Korean is on channel two, probably, or channel, what is that, eight? eight. Channel eight, thank you. Okay, so where are uh, the questions? Your questions, please. Um, who is going first? That's all, over there, please. Good afternoon. My name is Maria and I'm from um, Daejeon. I come from the city of Daejeon. I work as a career um, development manager director in an international school of business called Soulbridge International School of Business. We have 80% international students, only 20% Koreans. And I find it quite challenging as the director of the Career Development Center to help these students become aware of their career dream. I am now applying a, um, going into a studies of appreciative advising to help students discover what is their career dream. And I'm an Australian, um, been here only two years, so just trying to understand the different mindset of the students is, is a challenge in itself. But my question is, um, I find that in the Asian mindset, career dreams of Chinese and Kore Korean students tend to come from parents down to the students. So when we get to asking the students, what kind of a career dream do you have? It takes a long period of time before they express what is really their dream. First cap, first layer, happens to be what mom and dad really want me to do with my life. Um, this is very interesting in terms of research because of the, it's, it's a cultural issue of the very deeply rooted family and the need, the, the parental um, implication for the child at a very young age. So the self-directed career path, the self-directed fulfilling of a dream job has take, is going to be a longer process. Hmm? I'd like to ask any of the ones, any of the professors and individuals on the panel, if you can shed any light or if you have any ideas in this regard. And would you allow me one other question, very briefly? Okay, so um, Dr. Peter from United States mentioned how uh, entrepreneurship from your native Germany, if you failed starting your business, you were punished. My two years in Korea have showed me that the Korean heart really is entrepreneurial. But the way the government is structured at the moment, it's exactly like your Germany. There is no catch net for young Korean entrepreneurs who start their business to have the support from the government to allow for failure. Mm -hmm. So maybe Dr. Park would like to comment since she's working for the government. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But first of all, I'd like to ask if anyone else would uh, like to join in with a question or comment here. Yes. Here up front, please. A microphone. Thank you. Um, I think my question comes from a similar context to the person just presented her question. But my question actually goes to Ms. Park. Um, I work as a human resources manager at a smaller um, global company and because all the big um, Korean big name companies are sucking up all the talents and I have to struggle day in my day-to-day -day operations to attract the talents and um, because of the uh, stability oriented society that we have in Korea and in Asia I think because people are so reluctant to take the risks, there, there are seldom the chance to take the true opportunity. And I am struggling um, hugely with that aspect of the culture. And I, um, as, as a researcher of a, a agent level research center, do you think the constraints in the society and the government is changing in that aspect? Because, you know, I, I don't know. Okay, so we take a round of answers. Perhaps uh, Ms. Park will begin as she's been addressed, and then the two main speakers, perhaps. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, from my perspective of a career development, um, I will uh, respond to uh, both uh, two people. You raised the questions about career development in Career Development Center in university, and in, you talked about, you uh, raised question about the business setting. Yeah. Uh, can I talk about the both of you? Okay. Uh, from my perspective, of pers perspective, um, for uh, Korean uh, for uh, students from overseas countries, uh, they c university or college can provide uh, many workshops for c career explorations or career exploration seminars for uh, overseas countries. Uh, with the uh, initiative of uh, your uh, career development center. And um, from the government uh, point of view, government's policies point of view, I think to encourage uh, career uh, ownership or uh, career entrepreneurship, I think uh, entrepreneurship educational curriculum uh, should be more uh, promoted, should be uh, more fostered in every subject in, from uh, elementary school level to college or university, uh, uh, university level. So uh, luckily, uh, Korean government realized the importance of entrepreneurship education for career management for students as well as for people. Uh, they focus, they strengthen uh, focus in the uh, career uh, ex entrepreneurship education. Dr. Dr. Peter from the United States, yeah. Okay. Okay. It, it, it was one of the requirements that either your first name or your last name has to start with a P, otherwise you're not on this panel. Um, I, I, I like the term career dream, um, and um, I, 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 I fully appreciate the, uh, the, the cultural difficulties, and part of my research interest is to see if, if this Portean career is in fact a highly individualistic construct, a Western construct, and how it translates. I, I, I want to point to two things. Uh, in Asia and elsewhere, organizations are no longer able to absorb the number of talented and uh, motivated people that are available. So an alternative needs to be found, and one of the alternatives is a greater focus on self-directed careers. Cultural values are strong, they exert strong influences, but they can be changed. Uh, we can showcase success. We can start in education early to talk about the importance of uh, living one's dream. Uh, maybe this sounds like an American cliche, but there is there's some truth to that, uh, so that cultural norms and values can, can, can be changed. Um, about where we start, I want to talk briefly about Pedro's uh, questions. Um, the strict separation between education and work is an artifact of the industrial age where you went to school and then you stopped being in school and you started to work. Um, we need to rethink the relationship between education and learning. Um, learning about work, about one's contribution to society needs to start as early as kindergarten. Uh, the, the, the separation between learning and working is an artificial one. It's an artifact of the, 19th, uh, the, the 20th century. Um, and so, how early do you start about talking about careers as early as, as, as anything? Uh, academic skills can be taught in the context of contribution to society, right? Um, so that the differentiation is, 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 is taken away. Um, and finally, the uh, work is more than just employment. That's, that's the other message. Uh, there is, in every society, a lot of work that needs to be done, and people find ways of sustaining themselves by working to pursue their dreams. People work in community-based organizations and get funding from nonprofit organizations to do the work they want to do. So we need to broaden our concept of what work is. 
work is a fundamental level, a contribution to society. It takes place in organizations and outside of it. Okay, and Director Peter from Australia. <laughs> All the Peters. Okay. Um, well, uh, firstly, Pedro's questions. How early? Well, not everyone has, uh, is living in a household where people are working. So to give people an experience of what work is from a young age is quite important. But we're not just talking about um, work itself, but just ideas of problem solving and doing things. Sometimes they're just generic skill. Uh, so, uh, but a lot of people believe very young, primary school. Uh, the program in Tasmania um, started at 14, but there are other programs that start even a bit younger than that. Not everybody thinks that's a great idea because it sounds like you're actually preparing people for a mecha mechanistic lifestyle, but it's not, uh, that's not the aim. The aim is to sort of build skill set. Um, in terms of expanding networks, uh, a program that is operated by the Australian government is called the School Business Partnerships. It's a trial in which there's an increasing number of businesses. So try to encourage learning beyond the gate, beyond the school gate, is, is a process there. In terms of the cultural issue of students, there's been some interesting work in New Zealand with Maoris, uh, Maori population. And what they've done then is involve extended family in the career discussions. Grandfathers, grandmothers, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. And found that that was quite an interesting process because it fitted in with the culture. I don't think we should be frightened of actually working within the culture rather than trying to get people to adapt to other cultures. It's quite critical, actually, uh, because I think that you have a better chance of working within the system that's already working. Uh, so I, I actually believe that uh, the family approach and the, and, and the community approach to career development is something that should be explored more fully in, in the Asian region. Um, the other one was around uh, the small global company. Uh, that's no different to the problems that occur uh, in Australia. The big companies uh, recruit and get some of the cream. But there are other cream that don't quite make it, that don't want to work for the large organisations because they don't like the robotic nature of, of some large corporations in terms of the way they're trained. They prefer to have more experience and a broader range of opportunity in a small company. For example, there are 25,000 uh, uh, Koreans studying in Australia many of whom are not sure what they're going to do when they come back to Korea. And I think there's lots of ways of actually targeting that group. Thank you. Okay, and a final comment by Policy Peter from Jakarta. Yeah, just a quick comment on the culture issue. I think it's very interesting. You get this question every country uh, you visit. I, I've worked, as, as uh, Paul mentioned, um, even in my short career, relatively short career, I've, I've uh, been lucky enough to work in many countries in Latin America. Um, and when you, you go and visit schools and you ask uh, the students, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, you get the same uh, pattern that you get in, in Korea. Uh, it's either what their parents are doing or what their community, uh, the most admired people in their community are doing in small communities. So I think it's a lot about, it's the lack of information that, that makes you uh, look at the most obvious uh, option. So I think, in a, in, a, in a sense, I think career development can, can break that pattern uh, if, it, if it's done well. Okay, yeah, just a brief. Just, just very brief. Um, it's interesting to me that the academic literature on career development increasingly c defines career development as life design. So no longer just preparation for jobs, no longer just preparation for work, but design, conscious design, conscious choice of a life. A life in service, a life in production, a life is contribution to society. So the scope is very broad uh, in, in career development. So, thank you. We've uh, exactly hit uh, the margin of 5.30 and uh, sometimes uh, time frames uh, are important and will remain important also in the post-regulatory uh, age. Um, uh, Peter wants to make an announcement. I didn't please make it uh, yourself. Um, uh, I brought a couple of uh, career DVDs for the careers advisor. So, the person that asked the, um, the, the, the careers question, I've got a DVD from Australia for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and a big uh, thank you to everyone on the panel. Give a big hand to uh, everyone here of the four speakers.
And yes. also, again, a uh, big thank you to all of you in the audience. Uh, uh, I'll see that there is a wrap-up session announced in uh, Track B Vista Hall. Uh, that's right now, 5.30 uh, to 6 o'clock. Let's all move there. And otherwise, I wish everyone a uh, self-directed, multi-mountain life and a uh, safe trip home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. 네, 수고해 주신 파울 울테 교수님과 연사 토론자분들께 다시 한번 감사드립니다. 이것으로 트랙 시 모든 순서를 마치도록 하겠습니다. 참가자분들은 비스타홀로 이동